Good evening. Thanks for joining us for this first psychoeducational webinar on borderline personality disorder. It's a topic that is really near and dear to my heart um, for those of you who either treat BPD um, as clinicians or those of you who are family members of people with BPD or those of you who are patients with BPD. Um, I'm, I've written this talk to try to help expand your understanding of the disorder from various vantage points. So what I'm going to do throughout the course of this talk um, is to go over the diagnostic criteria and explain what they mean and make a plug for the power of diagnosis, why it's important um, what we know about the impact of diagnosis of BPD. Then I'm going to talk about some clinical features, how BPD presents in um, mental health settings or healthcare settings, and also talk about the longitudinal course, that is what happens to people who have BPD over time, so that you who are either clinicians, um, family members, or patients can know what to expect moving forward. Lastly, I'm going to talk about different formulations about BPD. So beyond the diagnostic criteria, there are different ways that we think about and conceptualize the disorder and all its different features as a syndrome, something that's actually really coherent and has underlying mechanisms. And the reason we talk about that is that there are many treatments now that work for borderline personality disorder, and they're founded on these formulations. That is different ways of thinking of the disorder. So if you can actually target the underlying mechanism, that can be a vehicle for changing a lot of the different features. So as you can see, I'm going to cover a lot of territory. Um, please do respond back. Um, I think one person has already raised their hand. Um, and uh, we will all work together to try to um, address the things that come up. So I'm going to start showing my slideshow. So first, the issue of diagnosis. Now, a lot of people come um, to us at McLean um, having had the problems of borderline personality disorder with real trials and tribulations over getting the correct diagnosis. And so I'm going to go over the diagnostic criteria that comes from the um, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's like our encyclopedia of psychiatric problems. And this um, manual just went into its fifth version, okay? So I'm going to talk about the most current um, diagnostic criteria and some of the controversy of how we got to DSM-5 and some new directions in thinking about the diagnostic criteria. So in general, personality disorders um, are syndromes where there's ways of thinking and feeling, that is cognitions and emotions, about both the self and other people. So it's inherently interpersonal um, that significantly and adversely affects functioning in many areas of life. So personality disorder is something that affects a lot of different realms of functioning. Um, that is um, how one manages to take care of oneself, basic activities of daily living, interpersonal interactions, work, school, more long-term goal-oriented endeavors. Now, borderline personality disorder has these diagnostic criteria, and I'm going to actually group them in what we call symptom sectors. So there's like four or sometimes five different clusters of symptoms within borderline personality disorder. First of all, there are symptoms that affect interpersonal functioning, that is, the way that someone deals with relationships. And these two symptoms include um, frantic efforts to avoid abandonment by friends and family. And the way that this plays out is that when a person with borderline personality disorder feels threatened in terms of a relationship, that that person might leave them, um, abandon them or reject them in some way. That could be something as mild as disagreement or rejection, and it can be something as severe as wanting out of the relationship. And there's a lot of strategies people with borderline personality disorder will use to try to um, avert 
that abandonment. They may become more desperately helpless, that is, do things that are reckless and self-harmful, or they may be hostile and threatening, kind of demanding things in ways that are scary to try to avoid that abandonment that they're very sensitive to. The other interpersonal feature is that they have unstable personal relationships that alternate between idealization, that is really loving someone and seeing only the good in them, and then devaluation, that is completely seeing a person as no good, not helpful, and even hating them. So it's that um, uh, I hate you, don't leave me kind of paradigm that we hear in the kind of lay literature that relationships be, become destabilized from when you have borderline personality disorder. It's hard to integrate the loving and the hating of someone into something that's more balanced, so there's extreme fluctuation. Now this third feature is more what we call intrapersonal, meaning having to do with one's sense of self. Self and relationships go hand in hand, and when relationships are unstable for somebody who has sensitivities with relationships, the sense of self is unstable, and vice versa. So what we see in borderline personality disorder is that people have distorted an unstable sense of self. That is that they may be really confused about what they want, what they feel or think, um, what they should do, who they are, and that may lead to a sense of just what's sometimes called identity diffusion, and that can cause a person to feel really lost and vulnerable, like the world can intrude upon them. Now the next set of symptoms have to do with um, behaviors. So um, the first symptom, impulsive behaviors that can have dangerous outcomes, things that are risky, like excessive spending, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating, and unsafe sexual activity. So these are things that typically happen reactively to stress. It's not something that someone is just globally impulsive and can't control themselves, but usually for a person who has borderline personality disorder, there's something that triggers these symptoms. In addition, people with borderline personality disorder struggle from suicidal and self-harming behaviors that are more extreme versions of self-damaging um, or risky behaviors that people will reactively engage in in times of stress. Now the next set of symptoms have to do with um, emotions or what we call affect, starting with intense depressed mood, irritability, or anxiety lasting a few hours to a few days. This is something that oftentimes um, gets confused with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a psychiatric condition where moods really fluctuate but at longer intervals that somebody is either really depressed or irritable and euphoric for longer spans of time. As opposed to that, people with BPD will have reactive moods. They'll get um, depressed, anxious, um, angry in reaction to what happens to them in their relationships or in their environment. At its extreme, people with borderline personality disorder are known to have these inappropriate, intense fits of uncontrollable anger. Sometimes this is referred to as rage. This is really a lot more intense than the anger that um, people without BPD may experience, so that when somebody is um, angry, it turns into a very aggressive experience and sometimes that aggression is turned outwards to these interpersonal symptoms or it's turned inwards to some of these self-destructive symptoms. Now lastly, there is this last um, stress-related set of cognitive problems, feeling of disconnect from thoughts, sense of identity, body, and stress-related paranoid thoughts. So this used to read dissociation or paranoia um, that is transient in response to stress. But this is much more broad, and it's, you know, we find that a lot of patients kind of use in very global, broad, varied ways the concept of dissociation. And that may mean that a person just feels numb to, disconnected from their sense of self. Okay, like I said, they have identity problems when they have BPD, and this kind of feeling of emptiness, disconnection, under times of stress has to do with that. 
And in addition, people may feel paranoid, meaning that they are constantly feeling like the world is going to wrong them. Someone is out to get them or um, doesn't like them or wants harm to come by them. That happens for people with borderline personality disorder when they're under stress. Now I'm going to move on to a little bit of a uh, of different terminology because part of the benefit of thinking about borderline personality disorder in different ways is that everyone's different. Different ideas, concepts, language appeals to different people and may resonate with people differently. So re for example, we've clustered the abandonment fears with the unstable relationship ship um, problem, the idealization, devaluation, that also can be conceptualized in terms of rejection sensitivity. This is something that I talked about at a recent attachment conference, which ha it reflects a propensity that people have to first get anxious when they haven't been rejected, really being preoccupied and vigilant to the possibility of being rejected, and then lashing out angrily when they think they're being rejected. They may actually be be rejected. And what happens is a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that when you lash out, you're likely to then actually be rejected. Um, intolerance of aloneness is another concept that John Gunderson has um, contributed to the, the thinking about borderline personality disorder is that some of these relational problems and other problems of borderline personality disorder come from just not being able to be alone. And that also may be additionally related to insecure attachments. Having a way of engaging people and relying on people that is ineffective and unstable. And sometimes these insecure attachment styles cause a person to feel more stressed by their support system when they're already vulnerable than less stressed, when, which is what happens in secure attachment. Now, um, the identity disturbance problems we've already talked about with just an uncertainty about the self, a self-confusion. That's another way of thinking about it. And like I said, some of the behavioral problems, like the impulsivity and the suicidal self-harming behavior, is reactive to stress, but more specifically negative feelings that may arise from stressful situations, like interpersonal situations. And some of these behaviors, believe it or not, have an adaptive function of self-regulating. So, you know, for those of you who may not have borderline personality disorder or just really not understand it if you're a clinician or a family member, um, people with borderline personality disorder do the things they do for a reason. When they self-harm, it makes them feel better in some way, okay? lashing out, taking control in even the most reckless of ways, overspending, restricting eating, using substances or, or um, alcohol. That's a way of feeling more in control when one feels out of control emotionally. Okay? And then the mood symptoms, either the depression, anxiety, anger problems, um, in addition to the chronic um, sense of emptiness inside, we think this has to do with mood reactivity, that moods are just unstable and context dependent, that things in the environment can very easily trigger mood states. And if you have BPD, this can feel really threatening. And no wonder people get paranoid because if things easily trigger them, they may really feel like the world is trying to attack them, okay? And um, the last thing I'll say about the transient psychotic and dissociative symptoms is that one way in which this can play out is that under stress, we all become disorganized to some extent or we become more disorganized than we usually are. For people who have BPD, they feel the emotions much more severely and then the impact of those intense emotions are more severe. So you get more um, like um, cognitively dysregulated when you're under those intense emotional pressures. And people with borderline personality disorder may have some bizarre thoughts, but the difference between that in borderline personality disorder and somebody having a primary psychotic disorder is that people with borderline personality disorder, when they're talking to someone that they um, are familiar with, they can usually sort out the difference between their thoughts what's, and what's real in reality. Now, I'm, I know that this set of slides is a little bit busy and hard to read, and I don't want you to worry about 
the detail. But I just want to give you an overview of future directions um, of the way that personality disorders are being thought about. So remember how I told you that the DSM-5 was a process of real revision from the DSM-4. That's the Encyclopedia of Diagnostic Criteria. And what happened in the world of personality disorders is that there was this really sincere effort to convert the diagnostic criteria to be more what we call dimensional, meaning that we all have personalities and personality problems lie on a spectrum that we have to greater or lesser degrees. And so one of the things I wanted to review is the kind of subheadings within the, the proposed set of criteria for the next DSM that needs more research, basically that um, we're thinking that all personality disorders have impairments in self-functioning, as you see here, that is identity, that it's markedly impoverished, poorly developed, and unstable, um, often associated with excessive self-criticism, chronic feelings of emptiness, and dissociation under stress. So you can see it's reconfigured over here. And that there's problems of self-direction a lot of people who know others with BPD know that motivation is unstable, that in some contexts they can be really functional, motivated, do really well um, in their endeavors, and in other contexts really fall apart. It's really striking. That's an iteration, that's a, a change. Now there's also impairments in interpersonal functioning, and the DSM um, proposed changes have to do with focusing on problems of empathy. Now, currently, empathy problems are kind of um, diagnostically um, specified under narcissistic personality disorder, which is oftentimes occurring with borderline personality disorder. But people with all sorts of severe personality disorders will have some sort of problem with having empathy stably for other people, being able to appreciate their points of view, being concerned about their concerns, and also have problems of intimacy, which may at the surface not make sense with borderline personality disorder because people with borderline personality disorder are quick to get very intimate in relationships. But having stable intimacy is a challenge that people developmentally face in their 20s and 30s. And it's hard for everyone, but it's particularly hard for people who have personality disorders. Next, there are just general personality features that put people at risk for severe personality problems like antagonism, being hostile, which characterizes a lot of the severe personality disorders and BPD, the problem of intense inappropriate anger. And there's also problems of just being prone to negative emotion, that what we call negative affectivity. Um, people may be having separation insecurity, which brings up a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, just general problems with anxiousness. What we see in BPD is most people have anxiety problems with BPD, and yet anxiety is not one of the formal diagnostic criteria for BPD, but the new thinking is that it just needs to be considered as part of the diagnostic criteria in general. And then um, problems of emotional lability, that means the emotion fluctuates all the time, and depressivity, that people can be very negative when they have borderline personality disorder. They just are prone to more negative emotions like anxiety, depression, sadness, um, and, and anger. And lastly, there are these problems of impulsivity that you can't control your impulses to do something, you can't inhibit them, but also more than that, a propensity to take risks. That people with BPD are just more prone to take risks than the person who doesn't have so that's just another way of thinking about it. Now, this is the part where I want to pitch um, some scientific information that shows the value of making these diagnoses. Because in the tradition of mental health care, we have just come through a period of time where a lot of clinicians have not wanted to make the diagnosis of borderline personality. There is a great deal of stigma towards the diagnosis, and because of the features of borderline personality disorder, people um, generally fear the angry reactivity, the fragility of people with borderline personality disorder, so they don't want to give them any bad news, as if misdiagnosis would be good news. 
So Mark Zimmerman, who's at um, Brown University in Rhode Island, has done some really wonderful research on the assessments for, diag um, for diagnosis across um, different psychiatric problems. And what he's found in his studies is that BPD is just pervasively underdiagnosed. That in a review of outpatients in his study, that of the people who met criteria for borderline personality disorder, only 3%, 3 in 100 of those people received the diagnosis from their clinician. I don't think there are many medical or psychiatric diagnoses where that happens. Now, the second finding is that um, people will tend to just actually write in the medical record diagnosis deferred. And that means that they're going to wait to make the diagnosis. And that's something that even when I was in training, I was taught to defer any personality di diagnosis because the idea is that you really have to get to know one, a person, to make the diagnosis. But what he found in his study is that you can actually meet a person for the first time go through a very structured interview and reliably diagnose people with borderline personality disorder. Now, lastly, there's a problem of misdiagnosis, where commonly people with borderline personality disorder are diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Now, importantly, about one in 10 people who have borderline personality disorder may also have bipolar disorder, but this is actually more rare than it seems. So because bi bipolar disorder, like I've mentioned, is characterized by extreme mood, mood fluctuations, people feel that um, people with BPD must have bipolar disorder, and there's medication for bipolar disorder, so it seems like a clear path to making a treatment plan. So it's quite compelling to clinicians to make this pro problematic misdiagnosis. But the difficulty is that medications alone are not definitive treatments for borderline personality disorder, so making that diagnosis may prevent a person from getting access to the care that might make a bigger difference. Now, I mentioned that people with borderline personality disorder um, are thought to have sensitivity to bad news or stress, so it might not be a good idea to diagnose someone with borderline personality disorder. So actually, we did a study here at McLean um, that was done by Gregoire Rubofsky with John Gunderson. And um, basically what they did was they assessed people pre and post diagnosis of BPD, and they measured their sense of shame, their sense of likability, hope for themselves, and overall well-being. And in 30 people who were given a diagnosis, their sense of shame and likability actually didn't change because part of BPD involves having really negative views of oneself, being very self-critical. But what did change was a sense of hope and overall well-being. Oftentimes, I've experienced that people with BPD feel better when they hear the diagnostic criteria and see themselves in the diagnostic criteria. It's very validating. And it gives them a sense that they have something that other people have common, actually, and they have um, something that other people understand. So if you have borderline personality disorder and you're being treated for depression and those treatments don't work, or even um, more problematic, treated for bipolar disorder when you don't have it and that doesn't seem to solve your problems, you may feel really alienated and like you're broken beyond repair, which is already a core belief that people with borderline personality disorder have. So when you get the correct diagnosis, it may give you a more optimistic view for a lot of reasons I'll talk about. Now, the, um, the impact of the diagnosis itself is huge. And our colleague here, Mary Zanarini, has done an important study on the impact of just giving people information about the diagnosis, like what we're doing here on this webinar. That just in giving people the information about all the diagnostic criteria and what they mean, decreased symptoms of impulsivity and unstable relationships in the 12 weeks um, after the, the um, diagnostic psychoeducation. So we're trying to actually get there to be a sea change across the country in services to help people diagnose borderline personality disorder and explain it to patients, because that in itself can really help patients. Now, one shortcut to this, if you are a clinician, a family member, or a person with BPD, 
is going to the NEA BPD website. That's the National Education Alliance for BPD. I've written that down here. And there's a wonderful document written by um, John Gunderson called the BPD Brief. It's a, it's a, it's a thorough but um, readable um, document that I have right here. And it, it explains what borderline personality disorder is. And it has some resources in it. So I encourage you to look at that. Now some clinical features. That means some, way, some things that happen for people with BPD that is likely to matter to you if you um, either work with people with BPD or have BPD or you love someone with BPD. Now BPD, borderline personality disorder, is very common. So um, what's really important about educating clinicians about borderline personality disorder is that they're likely to encounter people with this set of difficulties. People with borderline personality disorder have a higher use of medical services than individuals with mood, anxiety, or other personality disorders. And um, while the prevalence of borderline personality disorder is about um, one and a half to three percent is our best estimate through science. Um, of the people in waiting rooms in primary care offices, six percent of those people have borderline personality disorder. People with borderline personality disorder really want help for their distress. And it's also very common at all levels of psychiatric care. So you can see here, people who have BPD are a, a significant proportion of those people in clinics, in inpatient hospital, and in emergency rooms having psychiatric difficulty. Now, one other thing that makes borderline personality disorder complicated is that it almost never happens in isolation. People with borderline personality disorder are most likely to have other disorders. And of these disorders are what we call now internalizing disorders, where people have internal symptoms, mood, anxiety problems related to distress, and externalizing symptoms, where they act out in response to distress. So mood disorders in particular are very common with people with BPD. A majority of people with BPD will have some sort of mood disorder, mostly depression or dysthymia. Small proportion will actually have co-occurring bipolar disorder. And most people with borderline personality disorder have anxiety problems. In addition, many of you may know people with borderline personality disorder are very prone to have problems with substance use. In the face of very intense, uncontrollable emotions, the, the urge and the um, vulnerability to use substances is high. And lastly, antisocial personality. That is a personality disorder characterized by um, rule-breaking, um, harmful behaviors towards others, that kind of problem is also um, commonly co-occurring with borderline personality disorder. Now, this is about um, probably the most worrisome aspect of the disorder, suicide and self-harm in borderline personality. If you are a clinician, a loved one, or a person with BPD, this is something that is of great concern, it brings up fear and anxiety. And I'm just going to give you some numbers about it. 80% of people with borderline personality disorder engage in suicidal behavior in some sort. Overdosing, harming themselves, um, doing something to, to demonstrate that they want to die. For the average, um, the average for BPD patients um, have, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. So. The, the average number of suicide attempts that any BPD patient may have is three. And research shows that suicide actually is completed one in 23 attempts. So if, luckily, a lot of people with borderline personality disorder don't have enough attempts to be at high risk for completed suicide. But the concerning factor is that suicides do happen. So they're still of great concern. And the more suicide attempts you have, the more at risk you are for actually succeeding in suicide. Self-harm is something that is not the same as suicide. People self-harm um, to actually 
feel better in times of distress. It does something for them. And I know some of my colleagues here at McLean will speak more in depth to this issue. But when a person self-harms, their likelihood of suicide is um, up to 30 times greater. Um, eight to 10% of people who have borderline personality disorder will um, die by suicide. Now this is an older number that came out of the 1980s literature and newer longitudinal research suggests this rate is closer to around 5%, but that's still a significant number of people who will um, sadly end their lives when they can get help to improve their disorder. And this is 50 times the rate of suicide in the general population. And some research shows that suicides in cases of BPD comprise 18% of all US suicides and 33%, a third of suicides in young people. Um, functioning is really impaired in people who have BPD. And this is oftentimes a very complicated issue for um, clinicians, family members, and patients. That is that some people with BPD actually function very well in certain times and contexts in their lives, and then really are very dysfunctional in some basic ways. And this is more prominent in BPD than in other personality disorders and in other psychiatric disorders like mood and anxiety problems. I've written here the areas of dysfunction, which you can read here. But what I want to move on to is the longitudinal course um, of BPD so that you know how it unfolds over time and you can know what to expect. Now, there have been two long-term studies of the outcome for borderline personality disorder that have been um, conducted under um, research done by McLean scientists like Mary Zanarini and John Gunderson. So these are this graph, uh, for those of you that are really averse to scientific graphs. Let me break this down for you. So this is a graph that shows the decline in red in symptom number of BPD over time. So in one of the studies that was done, it was a, a collaborative longitudinal study that was done across many different sites in the US, um, showed that people with BPD over 10 years time go from an average of six and a half criteria of borderline personality disorder to one and a half or slightly over one and a half criteria in 10 years. That means that most people, even without treatment, will stop having symptoms. It doesn't mean they're better, but the symptoms will go away over time, which shows some um, idea that there is a good prognosis. The problem is that what happens during the years that you have active symptoms can be very challenging and destructive to um, stabilizing and continuing on a life trajectory that feels rewarding and satisfying. Now in the green, you see the percentage of people who remit, they fall out of criteria of BPD over 10 years time. And at 10 years, 80% of people with borderline personality disorder won't meet criteria of the disorder, even without specialized treatment. And then the probability of relapse is actually quite low once you remit. So the likelihood of developing full-blown BPD again once you get better for a sustained period of time is low, like one in 10 people um, over 10 years will have relapse in a significant way. Now, the problem with this is that doesn't mean people function well. So this is a graph that shows functional levels. And what you see is that BPD, when you compare it to other personality disorders in the red or major depression in the green, people with BPD, even when they have symptomatic improvement, don't actually function that much better. And they function worse than other groups of psychiatric patients. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip these two slides. I'm sorry. But what I do want to get onto is different ways of thinking about how the symptoms all hang together. Now, we've just gone over longitudinal research that says actually the prognosis can be good. The symptoms will go away. We have to think about how to get people to function better. But one thing that we can do is look at treatment. Now, when you have a treatment for any disorder, you have to formulate the problem to guide the treatment. 
In the field of treatment for borderline personality disorder, there have been um, significant debates about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, whether people's emotional instability is the core of borderline personality disorder or their interpersonal hypersensitivity is the core that causes the emotional um, instability. So there's still debates about that, but what we do know is that they're really interrelated. You can't separate the emotional dysregulation from the interpersonal sensitivity. So there are a lot of treatments that think about this in different ways. And the good news about borderline personality disorder is that there are many treatments that work. So there are a lot of options. That being said, I know that there is an access to care problem. These treatments are not widely available. Now, dialectical behavioral therapy is one of the best known treatments, and the way it conceptualizes borderline personality disorder is that it's a problem of emotional instability or dysregulation. And I'm going to explain how they think it evolves in a moment, but basically there's an interaction between a vulnerability and emotional sensitivity and a way that the environment responds that creates symptoms of borderline personality. Now, mentalization-based treatment is another more attachment-oriented treatment that conceptualizes borderline personality disorder as a problem of unstable mentalizing, meaning an unstable capacity to think clearly, accurately, and flexibly about oneself in interaction with another person in a relationship. And they think that this comes out of insecure attachment. Now, the last treatment I'm going to really focus on is a new movement towards generalist care, not having to be a specialist in borderline personality disorder, but rather being a good clinician out there in the community. And this is a treatment called good psychiatric management or general psychiatric management that was developed by John Gunderson and colleagues in um, Canada um, who ran a study on this treatment. Now, good psychiatric management integrates some of the current research and thinking about BPD and conceptualizes it as a problem of interpersonal hypersensitivity, that people with borderline personality disorder are really reactive to relationships, and that biology endowments that create temperamental vulnerabilities in people combined with insecure attachment causes behavioral and physiologic stress reactivity. Now, this um, diagram only goes to show that in DBT's theory of borderline personality disorder, the interaction between one's emotional sensitivities, their problems of emotional regulation, and their interactions with an environment that fails to understand them stably causes a kind of instability of mood that leads to all the different symptoms of borderline personality that there's behavioral instability, interpersonal instability, identity instability or self-instability, and cognitive instability. And to break this down, this is really interactive. There's a biologically based vulnerability that interacts with the way that the world treats the person. So this is where Marsha Linehan has really very brilliantly thought of dialectics within BPD. So this interaction between the biologically based vulnerabilities and the environment's invalidating or kind of um, not, not um, responses that come out of not comprehending the person with those emotional sensitivities, that translates into a set of features that, that um, define borderline personality disorder called dialectical dilemma. And one of my colleagues who specializes in DPD DBT will probably go into this more. But what you see is that when somebody's really emotionally vulnerable at the top, this interacts with um, environmental and self invalidation. So when somebody is very um, intense and emotionally reactive, what can really naturally happen in an environment is that the environment tries to shut them down, okay? To, for that system to function. So people in um, their environment might dismiss their negative feelings or try to think of simple solutions to really complicated problems. They may intermittently reinforce problematic behavior because they just simply don't have the time, energy, or the knowledge to deal with it otherwise. And what this can play into is what we call self-invalidation. People will criticize themselves and dismiss their own experience 
to undermine their sense of self and identity. Now, the other two axes, um, I've heard Marsha Linhan explain that the um, dialectical dilemma between apparent competence, that is looking like you're fine, but hiding a lot of your problems, and then active passivity, that is acting helpless in a way that invites rescue, that is determined by a problem in communicating. People do this because they can't communicate directly. Now, the other side of it, unrelenting crises, that is the tendency to just be in crisis after crisis, and then opposed to what we call grief inhibition, that means that you just suppress negative emotions. Those interact because someone's avoidant. Okay? I know that's very complicated, and one of my colleagues will likely go into that. Now, mentalization um, approaches this from a different point of view, that there's an interaction between a child and a caregiver and a patient and their care caregiver or an adult child and their parent. And what happens is that people in general start off in a, in a state of arousal when we're distressed. It's just a physical embodied experience of being upset. Like when I get anxious, my heart beats, my palms may get sweaty. When I get sad, I might feel dragged down. It all starts with somatic or bodily sensations. And you send nonverbal signals to those around you communicating where you are. And if you're lucky, your support system will respond in a way that is um, adequately resonant with what you feel and metabolized. Meaning that if I get upset, it's not just that my support system gets equally upset and starts to cry. But they show that they have some sort of metabolized view like, oh, you're upset. I feel sorry for you. And that leads a person to understand or represent themselves in more flexible, full, robust ways. And that's called mentalizing. And when this doesn't happen, what happens is that people develop these pre-mentalizing ways of thinking that are really problematic. For example, they might go into dissociated pretend mode where they can talk the talk like apparent competence, but underneath not be able to use any of their ideas or function well. So it's like a pseudo health um, or a communication that makes people look like they're healthy when they're not. Psychic equivalence is a tendency to be overly certain about things. Like I know you didn't call me because you hate me when it's unreasonable to actually have that degree of certainty. In interpersonal interactions, we all have to struggle with some degree of vagueness. And lastly, people with BPD are prone to reduce sentiments to action. So in order to show you their distress, they will do something self-damaging or self-destructive. And in order to feel like you care, they will need you to do extreme rescuing heroic things to visually demonstrate how you feel. Now, lastly, the interpersonal hypersensitivity model of borderline personality disorder explains the different fluctuations in the symptoms. So John has thought that when people with borderline personality disorder are feeling adequately connected to someone, they are idealizing, they think that person's best and very important, they're dependent on them, they are also anxious and worried that person is going to leave, and then they encounter some sort of stress, either perceived hostility, separation, or criticism, and that sends them into that angry, rageful, devaluing, self-injurious state. And because of that state, people either withdraw, causing people to, with BPD to feel even more alone, more dissociated, paranoid, and impulsive, and then in the worst case, despairing, suicidal, and without feelings or that threatened person gets rescued, and this sends them back into this kind of connected place. This is not the goal to just stay connected, because this repeated act of rescue can lead to enabling. But the idea is that we can understand what the symptom expression is based on what happens in relationships. Now, why is all this important? I am wrapping up. <laughs> so why this is important is it helps guide treatment. Now, there are many treatments that work. I'm not going to go into all of them. Some of my colleagues here at McLean can do that on continued webinars. But the idea is that based on these formulations or conceptualizations of borderline personality disorder, we have treatments that are aimed to address the underlying mechanism. 
uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, um, but I'm going to talk through um, this. You can look at it while I'm talking. This is an article that John Gunderson, Igor Weinberg, and I published in a magazine called Focus that explains all the different empirically validated evidence-based treatments for borderline personality disorder. I can't go into them at length, but they're described here, and you can look at them in that article, and they're described in a lot of different articles on BPD. John Gunderson has an article in the New England Journal of Medicine where he also has this, a similar graph to this. But one thing I did want to talk about is there's a difference between symptom remission and recovery. And even those are, there's a lot of treatments that work in one study comparing DBT and, and general psychiatric management, two thirds of all patients stopped having symptoms of BPD. But the level of dysfunction and disability remained high. And I think the treatments that we use need to do better at getting people to function, go back to work, even though that may be very challenging for a person with BPD. So what we're not now advocating is something called stepped care trying to spread out our resources so that everyone at mild levels of expressing this disorder gets psychoeducation. Everyone deserves to know more about what they have and what happens to them when they have borderline personality disorder so that they can start to manage it effectively. The next step is clinical management, and this involves understanding the symptoms, using a variety of modes of treatment, including case case management, help functioning, and medication management, as well as managing relationships to improve some of the problems of BPD. And if you're lucky enough to have access to group therapy and family therapy, that can be really helpful. Now, one of the things that I really want to advocate for is that people go to work to help stabilize their identity. Work is something that really structures everybody's functioning when they can do it. It gives a sense of identity, whether it's community service work or employed work. And this helps stabilize someone against their interpersonal hypersensitivity. So oftentimes we see people get in these really unstable relationships without having a job, and that is more likely to lead to a road of ongoing symptomatology. Now, what you can do if you're a family member, there's a great resource, again, on the National Education Alliance for BPD website called Family Guidelines. It has a run-through of some really quick tips of what you can do to help your loved one with BPD. Um, maybe in a future webinar we do here, um, one of our colleagues will go over these family guidelines, but I just want you to be aware of them. But I do want to thank you and invite questions at this time. This is a um, cartoon that says, I don't feel like we're making much progress with my abandonment issues doctor, and the doctor's not there. Part of what helps a person with BPD feel like people are there for them is just understanding their problem. So I thank you for learning more about BPD with me. And I look forward to hearing the questions from Don and Chris here. So thank you, Dr. So Choi Kane. Um, that was a great presentation. And we already have several questions coming in. One commonly asked question um, that I just want to point out is several people have asked whether this will be recorded. Um, some people were late in arriving or had trouble connecting. And so I do want to remind everybody that this webinar will be recorded. Actually, all of the slides will still be available. The links that we've provided will still be active in the recorded version of the webinar. And so um, we will post this as soon as we can do some basic editing and get it posted to our website, hopefully within the next week or so. Um, it will be live on our website, and you can certainly come back to it. If you found any of this information useful or helpful, you could think about referring a, a, another family member or a friend or the loved one with BPD that um, you've attended for um, and invite them to watch this webinar as well. And sometimes watching this together as a family can stimulate discussion and conversation about what can be helpful as a family. Um, if you need the link to our website, if you look in your upper left-hand corner, uh, there is a McLean Hospital logo, very tiny. If you click on that link, um, that will take you to our website, and then you can bookmark that in your web browser. So uh, Dr. Joy Kane, one, um, one of the questions that's come in is psychiatric professionals 
have traditionally put off diagnosing BPD um, in teens, claiming that it can't be diagnosed until early adulthood. How can this conception change and possibly assist more young people? I think this is a great question because the tradition in diagnosis, diagnosing personality disorders is that diagnosis doesn't happen until someone is 18 years old, which is quite an arbitrary cutoff. And we see in adolescents um, several kind of precursor symptoms, early signs of the disorder that can be easily recognized. And interventions can happen earlier when um, personalities are more flexible. We were all more malleable when we were in our teens. And so when you see even three features of borderline personality disorder in a teen person, which a lot of teens have these emotional dysregulation and interpersonal um, sensitivity problems, but when you have more severe features like self-harm or really severe mood instability that interferes with functioning, if you can get an early diagnosis of at, at least borderline traits, that might help um, a person get channeled into resources like DBT treatment or skills-based treatment or psychoeducation or family coaching that can make a difference in shaping that young person with these early starting, what we call burgeoning features that may unfold into more severe illness by early diagnosis. Now, the balancing issue is that a lot of professionals and family members and patients feel like diagnosing early is stigmatizing, and it's really a risk-benefit analysis. You have to think about the long-term well-being then in the short run, when you have any medical issue, like say you have um, cancer, you want to know about it as early as possible to best treat it and have the best um, outcome. But the short-term experience of caring about the diagnosis is giving it is very difficult, understandably. But we have to overcome that obstacle to help people earlier when they may be more um, receptive and um, supported in the process of change. So again, I want to remind people while you're still on the webinar that if there are topics that you would like us to cover in the future, if there are questions that you have, even if we can't get to them today, um, please type them in. Even if they're unrelated to tonight's webinar, please type them in and we will take them into consideration and try to address them in the future. So another question for you, Dr. Joy Kane. What what, if any, differences are there in intellectually gifted individuals with borderline personality disorder versus those individuals from the general population with borderline personality disorder? So does intelligence make a difference in terms of the symptomatology or treatment? Well, I think that um, a lot of different psychiatric disorders can um, come by different pathways. And Yes, there is a lot of variety in IQ level, cognitive profiles of people with a variety of diagnoses, including borderline personality disorder. And what we often see, we have a fairly um, high degree of educational attainment in some of the patients who come to McLean in our programs. And what we see is even though people have, who have high IQs may suffer from features of BPD, what might happen is they have a very vulnerable cognitive profile. That may mean that, to break it down, that some people are really good in, um, with verbal communication. Their verbal IQ is quite high, and it makes them seem like they're very capable of a lot of things. This lends to this idea of apparent confidence in BPD. They look better than they actually function, but their performance IQ, meaning the way that they solve problems, the way that they um, process nonverbal material, um, the way that they integrate different sources of stimuli or information may be pretty impaired. And so what happens is there can be a mismatch in the way that people think. So in some endeavors, like a lot of people with BPD might be quite creative and artistic or good in some sort of area, but when they have to do something that's a frame shift or it's something that requires greater integration or complexity of information, they may really fall apart. So people who have lower IQs will just express that this at a like more um, or a more simple level of um, 
what we call stimulus complexity, that is the information is less complex, so people with lower IQs may just experience this earlier on, but people with um, higher IQs might be masked in some of their difficulty for quite some time. And what we see is they really fall apart when they have big moves in transitions, like to college, when they have to make more decisions for themselves and integrate a lot of different ideas and concerns into their daily functioning. So that integrative function of the mind really can cause people to fall apart and become more symptomatic. Great. So Great. with that, it is 6 o'clock, and we are going to have to finish tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Choi Kane. Thank you all of the participants who have joined us. And again, if you have any webinar suggestions, we've had several wonderful suggestions, and we hope to provide future webinars. Thank you again, and good night to all. Bye-bye.